and all God's children said, amen. If you would, you can be seated. Miss Tori will be here to my left or right. If you have children that would like to go to Children's Church, she'll be waiting on them. I believe that is, uh, what, what's the grade from that again? Age? Up to fourth grade, you can go to Children's Church. We do have a nursery downstairs with people who are qualified to take care of your babies. And I promise you, they will love you and them just as much as you love them yourself. We're going to be in the Bible today, of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to be talking about act like a man. And there's many things going on in this world about acting like a man. But it comes to the, the heavy weight of me sometimes to correct other people. And there seems to be some people in this world that want to personify themselves or impersonate pastors of men of God. And they take these words and they take them out of context because, as the Bible says, they're fools. Don't, don't hurt me yet. But if you take God's word and you preach any other word other than what it is meant, God calls you a fool. Now, that's a four-letter word in the Bible. And we need to take that seriously. It's heresy. So why do I preach that this morning? There's a specific reason I preach this, because there's men and women out there that are saying that this right here confirms that they expect, and I'm not wanting this to be controversial, but this needs to be said from the pulpits, they're saying that this verse alone will show that God doesn't mind men portraying women and men portraying his women and changing their orientation as sex and so on. So to be clear, because there is a bill on the South Carolina floor coming up on the docket, it's called the hate crime in South Carolina, and they will be voting, and through this hate crime, if you say certain things, you can be fined and you can go to jail. So I want to make sure that I say it this year, I'll make sure that I say it next year, and I'll say it until y'all come see me in jail. There are only two genders. God created them in Genesis in the beginning of time. There is a male and there is a female, man and woman. Amen. Marriage is between a man and a woman, not two women and not two men. Now, we love everyone, but we will pause sin in any form, including the sins that we have in our own life if we're not in these types of sins. Anything outside of the bonds of matrimony that God ordained, because God created marriage, not man, not the government, God, is very easily seen in Genesis when he said it's not good for man to be alone, let's make him a helpmate. So man was brought into a helpmate and the woman was to help the man and the man was to help the woman and he was to protect the woman. He was to love her in the bounds of holy matrimony. And if you forget what your calling is as a man of God, as a husband of God, you need not go any further than God's word. And if you decide to step out of those bounds, men, let me tell you something. You are sinning. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you say. God says you're sinning against the bounds of marriage that he called. And if we're willing to walk in sin, walk in that sin. But don't try to use the Bible to say it's okay. It goes on if you're willing to stand up. Before I go any further, we'll read the first verse in Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Let's read it one more time. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Father God, as we move forward in this sermon today, I pray that we would understand what it means, as the Word would say, act like men. And that when every person that hears the sound of my voice today, whether they're out in a car listening over the radio at home, Lord whether in this church, in this sanctuary as the body of Christ, or whether they're watching at home online or on their TV in the couch. Lord, we will understand, and I pray there will be a better understanding of what it means to act like men. Because each and every one of us, male and female, have been called to do so when we understand the perspective of exactly what it means in the context of this verse. It was heaven and gracious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Folks, I want to tell you, before I went to seminary, you would often hear me say these words. You don't have to go to seminary to be a preacher. And I, to this day, I will tell you, you don't have to go to seminary to be a preacher. But I will tell you this, it helps. Because when you go to seminary and you get formal training and people say, well, the apostles didn't have formal training. Well, excuse me, they had Jesus. 
If I could train in eight years worth of seminary teaching and now I just started another doctorate in January and I would trade all that in for 12 minutes with Jesus, I would say that too. But I don't have that. I have Jesus' word and I have great men of knowledge who have transferred that knowledge into other works of the word that help us to understand this. And this is where we get it. But then you get these jack legs, as my dad would call it, that go out there and read it. It says, well, right there in the Bible, it says that Men are, or it says that well, Paul was speaking to everyone here, and it says that women, it says act like men, so women should act like men, so that just proves that transgenderism is okay to God, and that's wrong. That's not what this means. Transgenderism is a lie brought on by the selfishness and deceitful hearts of man and conspired in Satan's mind to fool the masses. That is the reason you have men that know what God's word says, and you have hypocrisy of people going out there with large platforms saying that it's okay because it is not. So let's get into God's Word here. And we'll understand exactly what it's saying. The first thing we understand, if we're going to be men, follow me on this. We'll get to it. It says we are to be watchful. Look, it says be watchful. If we're going to be watchful, we must be watchful over ourselves. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. So we are called to be watchful. And if we're going to be watchful, we have to do the watchful in several ways. One is over ourselves. Because if we're not watchful over ourselves, this world will come in, it will sneak in, and all it is looking for is a grasp hold, a firm grip. It's looking for a little toe hold to get in. Now here's the thing, when sin tries to get into your life, especially into your heart, it doesn't need no big opening, it's fluid. It will seep into every crevice, and then it will slowly start opening and open it so more sin can come in. So we must be watchful over our hearts, because Satan knows men and women in here today how to get to you. He's been doing it since before you were born. He saw when you were created. He understands the makeup of the human body, and he understands the lustful hearts and desires of everyone in here, because everyone in the sound of my voice today has lust in their hearts, whether it be for another man, whether it be for a woman, whether it be for food, whether it be for power whether it be for material things, there is lust in everyone's hearts. We can only cover, overcome it through the name of Jesus Christ and the power, spiritual power that he gives. But we must also understand that if Proverbs 4.23 is correct, it says, for from it flows the springs of life. If there is no life in the heart, then there is only death. If we are not watchful, watchful over our hearts, as it says here in 1 Corinthians we will not have life in our life, and only death is that to come for all eternity. Matthew 7, 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. If you ain't figured it out yet, there's a lot of ravenous wolves out there, and they are coming, as Matthew 7, 15 says, says they are false prophets, and I'm going to use this one verse. They're going out there, and they're using this verse wrong. Some of your Bibles, mine says, act like me, and I've got another one that says, be courageous or act courageous. So we must understand that when Paul was addressing this, he was speaking to the church. He wasn't just speaking to a subsect of the church or the men. He was speaking to the church as a whole. And when it says to act like men, or your translation might say, be courageous, he's saying, don't be a child. Be the man that I called you to be. He's talking about manhood. He's talking about the adult. And we see where it's strengthened by other letters of the epistles that Paul wrote. When he says act like a man or not a child. He said, be mature, be courageous, and stand on my word. Because if we do not, and we're not watchful over ourselves, our hearts will falter. They will grow stale. They will grow hard. And we'll get to the point where we're only wanting what we want and we could care less. You know, it's a sad point in our lives when we can get to the point, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do everything I've always done. But this part of my life, if I can't find the happiness I want, I'm going to push you out until I can find the happiness that I want. And then once I get where I want to be, then I will bring you back in and let you be a part of it. And God is saying from heaven, nay, nay, I want you to be a part of the happiness that I have for you in every step of your life because where you're going, leads to damnation and torment and sadness and it will wreck families it will wreck children it will wreck hearts and it will wreck testimonies 
So we must be watchful over ourselves. And we must be watchful over our families. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for the relatives, and especially for members of this household, he is denied the faith, and in worse than an unbeliever. Did you get that? It's worse than an unbeliever. Many of us will look at this and say, when it talks about preparing or taking care of our household, well, I've given them food, I've given them shelter, I've, I've given them their needs. Well, first thing, you haven't given them anything. God has given it to you to make sure that you provide it. But a family and a household need more than that. They need someone who is standing strong in the faith. They need godly men and they need godly women that are willing to act and be courageous, as we would see in 1 Corinthians 16 here, 13 and 14, to stand in his word that they may see the light of Christ in you so they will have that light of Christ in them. So the children and all the people who know them will have the light of Christ in them because I assure you this, if you are a young couple right now and you don't have children, whether you're listening, you're outside, you're in this church, and you're not making a step to be in Christ in every step of the form, you'll never have to worry about going to heaven and seeing your grandchildren because they won't be there unless somebody else steps in and does your job that you were called to do. We are called to be watchful over our families, and this can only be done if we are watchful over our faith. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication. Talk about perseverance going through and the supplication for all the saints. You are a saint of Christ and you are to go to Christ in every way and you are to be watchful over your faith. Those you can't depend on me every Sunday to get up here and point out these false atrocities, these heresies are being preached. And you need to know God's word so when you hear about it outside of this church, you can call it and say, no, you're wrong. Not because Pastor Bart said so, but because God said so. So we must be watchful over ourselves and we must be watchful over our families. We must be watchful over our faith or our faith goes on in 1 Corinthians 13, 14 to say, stand firm in the faith. Ephesians 6, 13 says, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. So we must stand firm. I remember when I was playing high school football, I remember one time I went out there and we were practicing. My good friend Jay Medlin, I miss him. He's going to be with the Lord right now. He's a year younger than me. We were getting ready to be in a fight. I knew it was coming because I was going to start it. I wanted his position. I wanted to be first string nose guard. He outweighed me by 40 pounds, but I was stronger and I was faster. And all I had to do was go out there and show it. And if I did good on Wednesday practice, Friday I was going to be starting. And he knew it and I knew it. And he knew I was going to beat him. Well, he didn't exactly know it, but I promise you, I knew it, that he should know it. So I went out there, and I had on everything I needed to play football. I had on my pads, had on my shoulder pads, had my mouthpiece in, had my fancy little gloves. I'm not even a catcher, but I wore gloves. Had to put a big cushion on my arm because I was, you can't do this now. My first goal off the line was to take this arm and put it in that Sinners chin every time. It didn't work much during the first half, but after they had time during halftime of that chin to swell up, they pretty much let me do whatever I wanted to in the second half. Apparently, that's against the rules now. But he comes up to me. I got my helmet on my side, and he grabs me by my um, shoulder pad jersey. He goes, so you're gunning for my spot? I said, I sure am. And he's got his helmet. Now, we're good friends, I promise you. We really are. And he takes his helmet that he's got on and he boops me in the head. And I go to the ground. Next thing I know, practice is over. <laughs> I'm on the sideline with water all over me where they had dumped it. And he got to be first string for another week because I came to the playing field with no helmet, but he had his on. If I'd have my helmet on, even though I didn't know it was coming, I would have still played. Now, I want to finish this story by letting you know next week I started. <laughs> but see, if I'd had that helmet on, 
I went and got knocked out. I don't think he, in, I think he didn't intend to knock me out. <laughs> it's the first time, probably one of the last times that I can remember ever being knocked out. All I remember is going thump and waking up. But see, if I'd have been wearing everything I was supposed to be wearing, because we got a rule, if you're on the field, your helmet's on. Doesn't matter if it's the game, doesn't matter if it's practice. If you're on the field, your helmet is on. If you're too hot, get off the field because you're not strong enough to play. You should have better endurance. The coach didn't say nothing because when I woke up, he said, well, you know the rule. Were you on the field? Yes, sir. Was your helmet on? No, sir. And that's the reason you're not going to start Friday night. And because of the big goose egg that's on top of your head. Folks, we must be reeling and ready to stand firm, but we cannot stand firm if we do not have everything that God has given us. That's the reason we find in Ephesians what he has given us. We are to fasten on the belt of truth. When we have the belt of truth on us, we understand what it means, what a lie is and the deceit is and what the truth word of God is. We are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. That protects our hearts. That protects the vital organs. That lets us know when the evil darts of Satan and his crazy wiles try to come after us, we understand they will never pierce the armor of God on our chest plate and be on the shoes or on our feet, be ready at all times with the gospel of Jesus. How do we do them? We put these shoes on and we must be ready to share the gospel whenever it calls. Whenever it calls. I was at Walmart the other day. I was going to buy some weed killer. I don't have any weeds in my yard, but I still want to be prepared. I went to the register. The girl's eyes were bloodshot. And I said, are you okay? She goes, yeah, yeah, it's, it's allergies. I knew it wasn't allergies. I could tell by the trembling of her voice. I paid for the roundup. Well, can't get round up. It was that other cheap stuff. It kills the weed in 24 hours, and then that comes back in 48. And I said, are you okay? Are you sure, sweetie? She said, I'm okay enough to be here and check people out. I said, listen. I said, Jesus loves you. Oh, she lost it. I said, Jesus loves you. She said, I know. She said, but it's so hard to believe that right now. Can I pray for you? She just looked at me and she said, you can pray for me. I said, can I come around? I don't know if you know Walmart here. It's a little register. Can I come around put my arm around you and pray? I ain't trying to be racist here. She goes, well, you're a white man. I'm a black young girl. And I said, I ain't worried about it if you ain't worried about it. I went around. I put my arm around her shoulder and I just prayed. Spoke the name of Jesus over her. I did not know, Michael, we were singing that song today. That's the Holy Spirit working. When I got done praying, she wiped away the tears. And all those bloodshed eyes were there, I saw a smile. So you have to be ready with the gospel. And sometimes it's not just preaching this word. Sometimes it's sharing the love of the word. But you have to be ready. You have to make sure you have on this armor, and we'll be going more in detail about it. We are to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word, and praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. We cannot go on the battlefield if we are not prepared. Many would look at David and Goliath and say, well, he didn't wear any armor. He just went out there with a sling start in a stone. I want you to know there is not a doubt in my mind that David, when he met Goliath, was not wearing every bit of armor that he needed from God. He did not need man's armor because he had God's hand and his protection over him. He was prayed up. And he was ready to defend his name. And he shared his word. Are you ready? Are you prayed up? Philippians 2.27 says, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and I see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing and firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Are you standing firm in the gospel? Are you understanding what he would have of you? 
There's this word when you hear him say to put on this, and it says to be act like men, talking about being courageous in his name. Are you willing to take the stand? Or are you prepared to do so? So when we get to the part of the verse and it says to act like men, it means simply to be watchful over everything that God has placed under you, your heart, your family, and your faith. What is it worth having anything else in this world if you lose your heart and you lose your family, thereby losing your faith? We must remember we don't dictate to God what we do. God tells us what we are to do. I don't know if I want to follow what God wants me to do. That is not your choice. You gave your choices to him. But I promise you, you'll find joy in that if you're willing to hear it. If you've gotten to a point in your life where your neck is so stiff and your heart is so thickened, you need to start getting back to your faith because you're going to lose your world in God. It says we must stand firm in the faith and then it says we must remain strong in Him, by Him and for Him. Let me put that again. We must remain strong in Him, by Him and for Him. So we must be strong. No human power alone can stop the devil's schemes. But God can and has already disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Colossians 2.15 is clear when it says he disarmed, talking about God, talking about Jesus, talking about the Holy Spirit. He's disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them in open shame by triumphing over them in him and him alone. Truth will always come out. Lies can only be hidden for so long. God will reveal the truth. It may be in a year. It may be in a decade. It may be at the end of your life, but the truth will come out. So many say, well, when I get to heaven, everybody's going to know. God already knows in heaven, but it's going to come out. And usually what I have found when you're young and you're trying to hide these things in your life that no one knows about, it always gets known at the worst time. It's usually when you're older and you've built a life up on sand instead of stone and your family and your friends start hearing the truth of the things you've done in the past and you start realizing it was never built on nothing other than selfish pride. So we must be strong and we must realize the source of our strength. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. If we're going to be victorious in the spiritual battles we face, we need spiritual power. The problem is one of us possesses, the problem is none of us possess spiritual power within ourselves. We are weak, we are frail, we are fallible, we are foolish creatures. We are often to the, on the losing side of the battles of life. If we hope to achieve victory, we must have true spiritual power. This verse tells us that the power originates in Christ and Christ alone. Our strength comes from nothing or from none other than Christ. Our strength comes not from within ourselves. It says be strong in the Lord. The word strong here means to be empowered, to be strengthened. It is the picture of someone who is weak being made strong. We are weak, we are weak creatures without Christ. We are weak emotionally. We are weak in the way we think. We are weak in our spirits. We are weak when it comes to tempting or the temptation of sin. We are weak in our ability to control our own wills and we are simply weak and we need someone to help us and the only one that can help us is Christ. If you believe that man is not weak in his temptations, look at what we see in this world. Look how they are trying to take God's word and manipulate it so the world can say even God's good with it when he simply says he is not. I will tell you this, you don't need a seminary background to dissect God's word when he uses the word wrong, when he uses the word abomination, when he uses the word sin, and then he gives you what those are, you simply walk away. You simply abstain. You simply do not partake. The strength we need to walk in victory in the battles of life will never come from within ourselves. Over time, we will fail. Over time, we will be taken to our knees but it's a good place to be when we find God there because he will lift us up from those knees and we'll stand victorious in him. But we must be strong. The strength we need, and in this verse when it says be strong in the Lord, that means that any spiritual strength we can ever hope to possess must come from him. 
Spiritual power can only be ours through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? Not just knowing him, but having a relationship with him. Satan knows Jesus. The demons know Jesus. They were in heaven together before they were cast out. They know who Jesus is, but they do not have a relationship with him. You are called to not only know him, but have a relationship with him. Before I go any further, I pose the question, do you have that relationship? Because if you do, God will give you the provisions. Our strength comes from Christ's provisions and the power of his might. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in the glory in Christ Jesus. The word power here refers to dominion. It speaks of the power to complete and perfect something. God only wants to complete and perfect you. He wants to complete and perfect your life. He wants to complete and perfect your heart. He wants to complete and perfect your relationships. He wants to complete and perfect your faith of walk. He wants to complete and perfect your knowledge of him and the wisdom he bestows against, uh, uh, with you to, that you may stand against the world. These are the provisions that he gives. Are we willing to accept them? It speaks of someone who possesses absolute ability. These two words describe the word of power we need if we're going to experience victory in the spiritual battles we face. Aren't you tired of losing spiritual battles? Aren't you tired of the guilt and the shame? Aren't you tired of waking up in the morning and saying, oh my goodness, it's daylight again. Thoughts you have in your mind when you know no one else knows of what you're thinking will destroy your family. We get these provisions by trusting in God and not in ourselves. If there's to be any spiritual power, any spiritual victory, it must come from Jesus Christ. It must be given to us by the Lord. But we must notice it's not only the provisions, but also the source of our strength. Ephesians 6, 11, it says, put on the whole armor of God. We just spoke of that. And that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the source of our stability is that of the armor of God. This is how we, am, this is how we are embattled by the wiles of the devil. This talks about the schemes, the lies, and the deceitfulness of Satan himself. The enemy, the enemy hates you. He wants nothing from you but your demise and your destruction. This is the reason that we are battling him every day. So this is the reason we are equipped or equipped by the armor of God. We just spoke about this armor. But is it beneficial to you if you do not wear it? Do you go out every day, not just in the world, but in your walk of faith, wearing this armor? You can never take the armor off. You sleep with it. I mean, if you move around a lot, it clanks. It gets a little loud sometimes, and sometimes it wakes you up. That's just God saying, hey, let's talk. I don't know why God woke me up three nights in a row at 410. The first night, I didn't think nothing about it. He woke me up at 410. I said, well, I guess the dog's got to go out. I said, come on, Milo, you need to go out. He wasn't getting up. Started drinking coffee. I said, okay, God, let's talk. Started praying. I think I better, I bet I pray for every family in this church. The ones that are coming and the ones that should be coming. Thursday morning, it wakes me up at 14, honest to goodness, the exact same time. And I said, well, Milo's not getting up again. I said, okay, God, let's go put on a pot of coffee. So we start talking. This past Wednesday night, Tim McCormick started a four-week study and he did a very, very good job. It's at 6.30 here in the sanctuary, 6.30 to 7.30. If you have nothing going on other than watching TV, you need to be here for one hour. He's doing a great job. But I took what he gave us Wednesday night, and I went through the entire thing. The first thing I said, boy, Tim did a good job. He put a lot of thought in this. But then I started reading the scriptures, and I said, God, what would you have of me with this? It was laying on the kitchen table. I don't even know how it got there. I know it's not my wife because every time I lay something down, she puts it up before I can find it again. 
And Friday morning, I woke up 4.10. Didn't say a word. Milo's over there laying on my pillow. Milo is my pillow, by the way. I'm not ashamed of having a dog in my bed. My wife's been sleeping with one for 30 years. I go downstairs. I fix another pot of coffee. If you ain't figured it out, I like coffee. And I say, God, what would you have me? He goes, you're going to be preaching a sermon on what it means to be courageous, to act like men on Sunday. He said, there's a few things, men, you need to work on before you preach it. Because right now, you're not sufficient to preach that word. And I said, Father God, I'm sorry. I thought I was doing all right. He said, you okay? He said, we just got to get a couple of the chinks hammered out, welded up. I could tell you what that is or, 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 or not tell you what that is. And I could tell you that me and him worked it out. But I'm going to share this sin with my church family. I found a TV show that I thought was kind of funny called Ghosts. I shouldn't have watched it then, but it was funny. I like to laugh. Who doesn't like to laugh? First season was okay, I guess. Got it the second season it started promoting homosexuality. And I said, well, I'll just look over that because the rest of it's funny. Then it got to the end of almost the second season it showed two men kissing. I was appalled. Not that they were kissing, because they're sinners, they don't know no different. But because I'm saved, and I do, and I watched it. I just turned my head, I said, ugh. It was over within two seconds, and then they got back to being funny. God called me out on it Friday morning, 5.17. He said, you got a chink in your armor. Don't let it happen again. He said, you've done real good about what comes into this house. Don't let it show on that TV that your girls and your wife bought for you as a present. So I went from the table to my knees and I asked for forgiveness. Now many of you sitting here today, ah, oh, it's an everything pastor. It's just a TV show. You can't get around it. You can't get by it. You just got to look over it. That's the problem we have in this world. We have too many Christians that aren't convicted and they're just looking over it so they can get on with their life. My life is Christ. What about you? This is the reason we are equipped. It says the whole word. It says the word whole here in verse number Ephesians 6 and 11 suggests that every piece, the armor of God, is essential to endure a victory over the enemy. There was a chink in my armor. We can't put on a few pieces and leave a few pieces off and expect to achieve success. I learned that on the football field when I got knocked out. We must wear every piece at all times. God has equipped us for the battles we face. He has given us everything we need to stand against the enemy and to enjoy his victory day by day. Still, it is up to us to wear the armor we have been given. It is up to us to put on and to leave it on. Remember our enemy, the day, Satan, the devil. He desires to take what he has given us. Satan wants your truth. Satan wants your testimony. Satan wants your marriages. Satan wants your spiritual power. Satan wants our doctrine. Satan wants our families. Satan wants our children and our grandchildren. Satan wants every good thing that God has put in your life. He wants it. And he'll make something look so good on the other side that you think you'll find true happiness that when you've lost everything and you've lost your testimony and you've lost your word and people understand that you're not the person that you used to be, not being courageous, standing firm, being strong in the Lord, as this would be described here, act like a man or being adult about something. And then you get to the other side, whoo, I got all that out. The baggage is gone. I can look forward. Let's go back to God. And you look back. No one was following you then. And no one's wanting to listen to you now. Because Satan made a lie look good. And it's tough eating an empty lie. 
All he wants to do is destroy. Notice the source of our strength and the source of our stability. The source of our struggles, Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are a couple of words here that stick out. The word wrestle is the word to describe we're in hand-to-hand combat. Every day you're in hand-to-hand combat. Whether you come ready to fight or not, Satan's ready to fight. And the word for here reminds us, while we must wear the armor of God, if we are to be successful in the battles of life, the word for means that we wear this because we are in a battle. But we can do this, and we can win this, and we can all be mature and courageous and acting like men, men and women, as we have been called to be in believers in Christ, by God's love for you, because he will guide Psalms 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. You know, here's the great thing about God when he's in heaven. We're made in his image, but God's eyes constantly on us. God never blinks. God never blinks. You're constantly in his gaze. What gaze do you have upon God? Are you acting courageous? Are you acting mature in Christ? Are you steadfast? Are you firm in your faith? Are you strong in your abilities? Are you so caught up in your own desires you're ready to shed everything in your life to get what you want in the flesh and not what God wants in your soul? Let us pray. Father, thank you for this morning. I pray this morning as we come during this time of invitation that there's someone here today that needs to hear your word. Father God, I pray they would hear it now. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen.